Welcome to the 8 in 8 series presented by the STS Workforce for Critical Care. Today we'll discuss right ventricular failure in cardiac surgery. My name is Nathalie Roy and Hitoshi Hirosa and myself participated in the content of this presentation. The right ventricle is thin and wraps around the LV. The septum is a major contributor to the RV function and ejection fraction. Normally, the right ventricle systolic and diastolic pressure is low, thus the RV is perfused throughout the cardiac cycle. However, a sudden increase in RV afterload or wall stress will compromise the RV perfusion. A failing RV reduces LV filling and causes hypotension. There is reduced cardiac perfusion, coronary ischemia, and arrhythmia. This figure summarizes the pathophysiology of RV failure. With RV pressure overload comes dilatation and reduced contractility. The increased wall stress augments oxygen demand and decreases coronary perfusion, leading to worsening arrhythmia and ischemia. Tricuspid regurgitation is induced and there is an increase in RA pressure and CVP. There is altered ventricular interdependence, reduced LV filling, reduced cardiac output, and lower mean arterial pressure. Shock. Because of the combination of lower mean arterial pressure and high central venous pressures, there is further coronary ischemia and end organ damage causing AKI, liver failure, and intestinal ischemia. Patients with RV failure present clinically with hypotension, poor perfusion, and cyanosis. They have elevated venous pressures and can develop ascites and peripheral edema. They often have arrhythmias or loss of capture of their atrial leads after surgery, and they're prone to develop end organ injury. RV infarction is an important cause of RV failure, either preoperatively from incomplete revascularization or early graft failure after surgery. RV failure can also be caused intraoperatively by poor myocardial protection during surgery. In the setting of pre-existing pulmonary hypertension or elevated PVR, Patients can develop acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis and lose cardiac output in the setting of a strain and dysfunctional ventricle. In addition, postoperative pulmonary embolism is sudden and may necessitate mechanical circulatory support if thrombolysis is contraindicated after surgery. Postoperative tamponade affects both ventricles, but impacts RV filling first because of the relatively lower right-sided pressures. In addition, certain populations will be more at risk to develop RV failure. Patients undergoing LVAD placement for chronic LV failure will often have elevated PVR, and the right ventricle may not be able to increase its output rapidly to match the VAD. The right ventricle fails and the septum becomes dyskinetic, bowing to the left side, and compromises LVAD filling. Postoperative fluid overload obviously worsens this physiology. Another special case is heart transplantation. Patients are at risk in the setting of lung ischemic times and perhaps suboptimal organ preservation. The recipient often have elevated PVR and there's fluid af overload after surgery. Finally, adult patients with congenital heart disease and long-standing pulmonary valve disease or shunts have dysfunctional large right ventricles and they're also prone to postoperative dysfunction. A pulmonary artery catheter or swan guns can guide the clinician to diagnosing RV failure and is very helpful in managing these patients. In RV failure, there's increased CVP, often in the mid-teens to 20s. A prominent A wave is present from the increased RV diastolic pressure. And a V wave is indicative of tricuspid valve regurgitation. In addition, with worsening RV function, we note reduced PA pulsatility. An emerging tool validated in RV infarction, heart failure, and post-LVAD is the concept of PA pulsatility index, or PAPI. It represents the difference in systolic and diastolic pressures over the CVP. A score inferior to 0.9 is predictive of RV failure. Other markers of low cardiac output, such as Reduced end tidal CO2, especially in relation to the measured CO2, can be useful at the bedside. Elevated lactate, creatinine, and LFTs, and low glucose are markers of end organ damage. An EKG can be helpful in diagnosing arrhythmia, 
RV strain and as demonstrated on this EKG here, uh, inferior ischemia. Diagnosis at the bedside includes an echocardiogram. Features of RV failure include an enlarged RV with flattening of the RV septum or bowing towards the left side and increased RV to LV ratio as well as tricuspid regurgitation. The TAPSI or tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion is reduced in RV failure. A value of 16 or less is considered abnormal. A cardiac catheterization can be diagnostic and therapeutic. A right heart cath and PA line placement is performed. A coronary angiogram and possible interventions can also be performed. Finally, depending on the degree of RV failure, temporary percutaneous mechanical support can be considered. The medical management of RV failure is to support the RV and circulation with inotropes. If the patient is in shock, they will need epinephrine to support the right ventricular function and possibly norepinephrine in addition to increase the systemic pressure without excessively increasing the myocardial demand. If the patient has severe RV dysfunction but maintain arterial blood pressure, milrinone or dibutamine may improve RV inotropy. Both drugs cause systemic vasodilation, however, and milrinone has lasting effects, especially in the setting of acute kidney injury. For mechanically ventilated patients, it is important to optimize vent ventilator synchrony and reduce mean airway pressures. Pulmonary vasodilators, such as, as inhaled nitric oxide and inhaled epoprostenol, are helpful in decreasing RV afterload and can be delivered uh, via high-flow nasal cannula. Targeted fluid management with a PA catheter and diuretics is critical to the management of RV failure. Renal replacement therapy is often necessary if acute kidney injury is present. Other important principles include heart rate optimization, arrhythmia management, as well as correction of acidosis and draining effusions. When medical management is insufficient, there are mechanical circulatory support options. For severe shock, the RV and organs can be resuscitated with ECMO. It offloads the RV, reduces RV wall stress and provide excellent oxygen delivery for resuscitation. In the setting of isolated RV failure, or if the patient has an LVAD in place, a percutaneous RVAD can provide up to four and sometimes five liters of cardiac output. Emerging data shows promise for the dual lumen cannula RVAD, or PROTEC duo, and for the percutaneous right-sided axial flow pump, or Impella RP. When more support is needed, temporary paracorporal pumps can establish more support or by V support, especially after cardiotomy. The goal is to optimize patients for recovery, which may require revascularization. These pumps should be weaned over days to weeks. Currently, there are no approved implantable RVADs. If there is no recovery, Patients need to be evaluated for transplantation, and other options for long-term support include the total artificial heart, or off-label use of implantable pumps on the right side. Thank you for your attention.